Um, so we have with us Cameron Smith, who has been a member of BIMGA for nine years and is a graduate of BIU's Horticultural Technician Program. His gardening efforts focus on food crops, West Coast native plants, and ornamentals for pollinators and beauty. He has served as Vimga's treasurer and webmaster and designed and implemented Vimga's website, which you can find at uh, org. And so without further ado, uh, welcome Cameron and I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much, April. And welcome to everybody. Uh, today we're gonna talk about lawn care and lawn alternatives, which may seem kind of contradictory, but um, Lawns can be quite useful, they can be quite beautiful, they can be quite uh, practical. And so even if you don't keep uh, your entire property in lawn, you may want to keep patches of lawn. And if you do that, you want to keep them healthy. And that's where the lawn care comes into play. And if you decide to remove parts of your lawn, well, we'll talk about what to do uh, when you do that. Before that, uh, let's get on to a bit more housekeeping. Um, this presentation is being presented by me, Cameron Smith, uh, with the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library. Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of the Master Gardeners Association of BC, a registered nonprofit society. We are part of an international organization of specially trained volunteer teachers and consultants who work in partnership with public sector agencies and private enterprise to teach and promote science-based, sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. This seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. It is intended for educational purposes only. Copying and or commercial use of all or part of the seminar or its contents is prohibited without express written consent from the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Vancouver Island Regional Library. The information in the seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of Vimga's knowledge and mine. Use of the information in the seminar is at the sole discretion responsibility and liability of the user. That's you. All right. Lawns. What's a lawn? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's a portion of garden or pleasure ground covered with grass, which is kept closely mown. Wiktionary uh, says it's an open space between woods, ground, generally in front of or around a house covered with grass, kept closely mown. Well, that's what we pretty much know it as. Why do we want to keep a lawn? What are the pros and cons? Properly maintained lawns look good and can, it's argued, increase a property value. That's if it's well maintained. Lawns can anchor the soil and prevent erosion uh, from excess runoff. If you have a very sparse lawn, if it's not uh, kept, kept up or if it's missing, then uh, runoff can uh, take soil away from the, uh, from the area and wash it into the streams and lakes and so on. There are natural filtration system. The, uh, the roots help uh, filter the water, slow the water, and filter it out. Uh, and they're probably the very best thing for running around, rolling around, and playing games, be it tag or bocce or badminton or what have you. Lawn darts, anybody for lawn darts? On the other hand, they take a lot of water to keep looking green and lush. An inch of water uh, on a lawn, depending upon its delivery method, can take four or five hours of running a sprinkler. And during the hot season, you may need to do that more than weekly. That's a lot of water. 
if you have a tendency to use herbicides or fertilizers on your lawn, first off, don't. But if you do, those chemicals can run, run off into the streams and lakes and eventually oceans and have a serious impact all along the way. And you have to mow it and mow it and mow it. Now, admittedly, a lot of us don't water in the dry months, so we don't have to mow. But at that point, it's not a very attractive lawn and it's not much fun to roll around on. So what's the point? And finally, there's problem solving. Repairing bare spots with various techniques like aerating and overseeding, dealing with infestations of both flora and fauna, think of weeds and chafer beetles, uh, reversing soil compaction and on and on and on. So you may wanna keep some, you may wanna lose some. If you decide to keep some, you have to keep it looking good. And that's where, that's where lawn care comes into play. First off, let's talk about mowing. You want to mow high, three to three and a half inches. Some will even say four inches. Mowing high helps shade the soil so that there's less evaporation and weeds struggle for light. Mowing high also produces deeper, healthier root systems. Take a look at the bottom one. Mow when the grass gets to four inches so that you never take more than a third of the grass blade. So over here, keep two thirds, remove the top third. So if that's four inches, taking off an inch, you're down to three inches. Is that right? Something like that. And always keep the mower blade sharp. If you don't have a nice sharp blade, what you're doing is ripping the tops of the blades and uh, you're going to introduce pathogens and the tops of the blades are going to start to brown and look uh, kind of ratty. Keep the mower blade sharp. Uh -huh. Watering. Underwatering tends to lead to poor quality grass. Overwatering leads to high water bills, contributes to lawn disease, and leaches nutrients out of the soil uh, and into the groundwater. When watering, the goal is to completely fill the soil to the bottom of the root zone. And this surprised me. Uh, the root zone for grasses can go uh, 12 inches deep and often greater for uh, some of the lawn grasses grown uh, in this area. So that's a lot of water. You want to fill 12 inches uh, of soil with water. Generally, an inch uh, of water uh, will fill that root zone. Uh, so for silt and loam and clay, uh, you want to do about an inch when you're what when you're do for each watering. For sand, you want the same amount, but because the water runs through the sand so quickly, you only do half an inch, but do it more often. If you've got compacted soil or heavy clay, you still want that one inch, but you have to apply it more slowly to prevent runoff. And the way you do that is to, to decrease the rate to allow the soil more time to take water in. This might require using a smaller sprinkler nozzle or using sprinklers that have a lower application rate. Or you can even cycle the sprinklers running for 10 minutes on, then 10 minutes off, then 10 minutes back on, and so on and so forth. How often? Um, fortnightly, every other week in the spring or fall, weekly, or maybe even more in midsummer if it gets really, really deep, uh, really, really dry. So how do you know how much you're putting on? Uh, it's actually pretty simple. Place straight-sided cans uh, on the lawn during watering. And then when you're finished, or you think you're finished, measure the amount of water in the can. 
and that'll tell you how much you've applied. If you haven't applied enough, um, put more on and keep track of the time. So if you went for three hours and you only got three quarters of an inch, then add more time um, until you get an inch and then record that time. So next time you know how uh, how long to keep the uh, keep the sprinkler going. Fertilization. If you leave the clippings from the mow, from the mower on the lawn, that may be all you need. When you think about it, that blade of grass contains everything a plant needs to grow because it's just been growing. So if you leave it to decompose, all of that goodness goes right back into the soil. But be careful when you do that. Don't do this. Oh, come on. All of that grass, that's preventing light and uh, uh, that's preventing light from getting to the lawn below. And it may be preventing water from getting to the lawn below. So what you're going to wind up with is dead, bare patches. Always make sure this looks like somebody took a really, really long lawn that hadn't been mowed for a very long time and just uh, left it sitting there, and that's not good. For one thing, he shouldn't have. They should not have left it that long before mowing. And secondly, this is just going to kill a lot, large part of the lawn. So don't do that. Another thing you can do uh, for fertilization is spread a thin layer of compost and then rake it or water it in. Uh, you can use organic fertilizers or slow relief release fertilizers in the spring. Now an organic fertilizer may contain ingredients such as feather meal, bone meal, glacial rock dust, powdered eggshells, worm castings, gypsum, and so on. You can even make up your own mixture. Bucker Fields here in Nanaimo has many of these ingredients in bins in their garden section, way back in the back. More lawn care, aerating and dethatching. Aeration is poking holes or removing small plugs from the lawn. It's generally used to improve air and water penetration. It's really ne only needed for heavy clay, excuse me, or uh, heavily compacted soils and could be done as often as yearly. You can overseed the holes to help help it fill in more quickly. Dethatching, rarely needed, only when it becomes thick and impenetrable. Thatch is uh, dead, dead material, uh, dead grass and other organic material uh, on the soil surface. This patch, you can see this is a patch that I took out of my lawn and um, That's where the soil is down there at the bottom. And then we've got a layer of thatch almost an inch deep. And then, yeah, I didn't cut this quite, quite deeply enough, but, and then the lawn going up to three inches. There's that three inches. I made sure I made, mowed that uh, properly before I took out the plug. Um, does this need to be dethatched? Probably not. This is a really loose thatch in here. Uh, it's mostly mosses, and the uh, the grass above it is is quite healthy, quite lush. Uh, so, dethatching? No, probably not. All right. What about weeds? Get rid of the herbicides first off. Uh, minimize soil disturbance overall. Um, Keep the grass long. Again, you want to shade the soil and uh, help prevent the the seeds from getting light, uh, the weed seeds from getting light. Don't aerate or dethatch until you really have to. What you're doing is bringing seeds to the surface where they'll get light and start to germinate. You don't want to do that. Um, overseed to crowd out the weeds. 
especially if the lawn is patchy. Um, a lot of people will overseed uh, on a yearly basis anyway, which is probably not a bad idea. Pull weeds early in the spring. Now, this is really important. When you go out in the early spring and you start to see those little weed seeds coming up, uh, pull them right away. It's easier. Uh, they don't get a chance to get established. And it's so much easier than later when they, they are established and the soil is drier. Uh, get out there, especially things like uh, uh, bittercress, uh, one of the really early ones. And it's amazing how quickly bittercress will go to seed. And bittercress is that one where as soon as you touch it, all those little seed pods just explode everywhere. Uh, you don't want those. Um, when it comes to herbicides, a lot of people have been talking about corn gluten herbicide. And this is something that I hadn't heard of before. Um, but it's it's tricky to use. It doesn't prevent weed seeds from germinating. But what it does do is prevent them from forming roots after germination. This means that uh, applications of the, of the herbicide must be very carefully timed. Um, when it's timed correctly, seeds germinating will form shoots, but not roots, and they will therefore die, provided there's a short dry period after seed germination. If uh, conditions are too wet immediately after germination, the weed will recover and establish a root. So after application, the corn gluten needs to be watered in either by rainfall or by artificial watering within five days of application. Rainfall of about a quarter inch or, or artificial watering is ideal. After this, a dry period of one or two days is required to prevent seedlings from, uh, that have germinated from growing roots. So it can, it can be really tricky to get this application timing precisely correct and it may require repeated applications to see the desired results. Um, also keep in mind that corn gluten can also inhibit um, turf grass seeds from becoming established. So if you're overseeding, uh, that may never happen for you. And moss, what do you do about moss? Well, moss generally grows where grass won't. It thrives in damp and shaded areas. Uh, so the turf tends to be thin and decline over time while the moss flourishes. Um, drainage problems and overwatering promote moss. So you can try to increase the drainage uh, and reduce the shade uh, on that area. Uh, or you can simply remove the turf and the moss and replace it with shade loving plants, ground covers, that sort of thing. Uh, or finally, you can just enjoy it. I mean, it's green. That's what you're after, right? Soft, green. Uh, so there you go. All right. So we've taken care of the uh, patches that we've uh, decided to keep. And now we're going to go on to um, what to do once you've made the decision. Um, you no longer want that patch of lawn. Uh, this is uh, the lawn uh, on the property that we bought in 2009. It was uh, overgrown and uh, unkempt. And uh, we found out that uh, there was indeed a vegetable garden uh, on this spot uh, sometime in the very distant past. So we figured we could probably uh, turn it back into that. So that's what we did. Um, that's our vegetable garden, one of our vegetable gardens. Uh, so how do you do that? How do you remove the sod? We went with a backhoe, at least for, for part of it. Um, this backhoe came in with, uh, with a company that was doing uh, the perimeter drains around the house. Um, 
So we decided, well, while you're here, let's uh, get rid of some of this grass. There are other ways you can do it, of course, and, and I've, I've done them pretty much all. Uh, you can use a spade, you can use a sod cutter, uh, you can use a tarp or, or plastic sheeting uh, or uh, sheet mulching with cardboard and, and uh, newspaper. Uh, or, yeah, you can use uh, the backhoe. And then what do you do with it? Well, in this case, um, this wasn't uh, related to the picture you saw before. Uh, this is uh, more recent when we decided to remove the lawn from the orchard, which is behind the little uh, uh, machine here. We had this... Uh, We had this uh, dry creek and uh, I didn't like it because uh, dry creeks are almost impossible to keep weeded. Uh, soil keeps falling in, weed seeds keep falling in and they keep sprouting. So we decided, all right, let's get rid of it. And we did that, we just filled it in. <clears throat> now, in the previous um, photo of the, the main garden bed, uh, I don't re remember what we did with that sod, but we probably just trucked it off to DBL or some similar site. They took care of it for us. Lawn removal, mechanical methods, a spade. Um, the spade has a flat blade. And this is something that uh, I learned some time ago, but a lot of people don't recognize a spade has a flat, um, flat blade like this, whereas the shovel has a curved blade. So a spade is what you want for sod lifting. Uh, you can get in and um, you get a nice, even, amount of soil underneath the sod, lift it up, turn it over, and uh, and you're done. Uh, a lot of people think that the difference between a shovel and a spade is uh, the pointed or square tip, but no, it's the shape of the blade. Sod cutter. Um, motorized or human powered. Uh, the one pictured here is from the uh, website of share cost in Nanaimo, they rent, they rent that beast. Um, I, I used one 14 years ago from share cost, but as I recall, it was uh, quite a bit older and it was a lot heavier than what this one looks to be. Human powered side cutters are also available. I didn't know about these and I've got to see if I can find one because they look really nifty. And of course, the backhoe or front 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 loader. Um, very quick, uh, you can get a lot of uh, material move, but uh, obviously somewhat more expensive. All right. Um, and a fourth way that you can do it is sheet mulching. Uh, the goal here is to uh, prevent light from getting to the grass and weeds. Without light, the grass and weeds will, will die. Uh, by adding compost and using decomposable materials like cardboard and, and paper, we're actually making new soil as we're doing this. Start by mowing the grass as short as possible. In addition to mowing, you wanna remove any pernicious weeds blackberry, bindweed, buttercup, quackgrass, things like that. Uh, get down, down there on your hands and knees if you have to and pull them. Um, a lot of them will not be completely killed by sheet mulching. Lay down a, a thin layer of compost or grass clippings or other green material, especially if you're working with heavy clay. Um, and if you're working with heavy clay or badly compacted soil, you might want to aerate the soil with a garden fork or a broad fork. Just break it up.
add a layer of newspapers uh, or other paper and or cardboard. Um, cardboard is slightly problematic because it can prevent gas exchange and water penetration, especially if you're using really heavy cardboard. Um, but it can work and I've, I've uh, done it before. For paper, you can use newspapers. Uh, you need six or eight or even more uh, layers of newspaper. You can use rolls of craft paper, um, like like we see right here. Uh, there's the cardboard, and there's the newspaper. Uh, or you can use roll ends, uh, which are the rolls of newsprint that newspapers used to sell. I don't know if they still do or not, if you can find a newspaper. Um, it's really important to keep the uh, paper or cardboard thoroughly wet. Wet it down as you're laying it down. Keep it wet uh, until you've got the um, compost and mulch laid on top of it. And even then, you have to keep it wet. Uh, on top of the uh, cardboard or, or paper, uh, add another layer of compost or manure or other greens. This again just helps build the soil. Top it off with a thick layer, four to six inches of organic mulch, uh, like wood chips or, or bark mulch. Now, at this point, depending on what the uh, area is going to be used for, you can top it off, you can finish with the, the mulch, or you can, can, can continue layering, alternating between brown and green materials, just like building a compost pile. This is what uh, we know as lasagna gardening. Uh, and then top it with mulch. Do this in the fall, especially around here so that the whole area stays, stays wet. If the paper material dries out, it can turn hydrophilic, meaning that the water will never penetrate and it will really start to kill the soil itself rather than just the, uh, the roots in the, in the soil. And then finally, next spring, uh, you can plant directly through the mulch into the ground below or remove the mulch and install ground cover or, or what have you. All right, don't do these. Black plastic sheeting. I know a lot of people swear by it. Uh, it's used quite a bit in agriculture where they will lay down long, long rows of, of it and punch holes in it. You can even get a, a, a device uh, which is just a wheel with uh, big spikes in it to punch the holes as you wheel it down the row. Um, yeah, it will kill the grass uh, and every living thing in the soil below. You're essentially sterilizing the soil. Uh, it prevents gas exchange. It prevents water from getting in. Uh, so it just kills everything. Uh, plastic can leach chemicals into the soil. It can break down into microparticles that wash out into the streams, rivers, and oceans. And we all know more these days about uh, microplastics and, and uh, how we don't want them. Solarization. A lot of people talk about solarization, and it can work, but it has the same problems as, as, uh, as above. Plus, it doesn't really work in this area. We just don't get enough hot, hot, sunny days to really solarize or kill everything under that uh, white plastic. Um, especially in this area, you, you'll see reports of uh, people taking up the plastic and uh, weeds are still uh, growing and uh, even some of the lawn may not be uh, fully fully uh, dead. And finally, herbicides, just don't.
All right, so now we've got the lawn removed. What do we want to replace it with? Well, vegetable garden, obviously. Uh, that's one of the first things you might think of. And again, that's what uh, we wound up with. Uh, that wasn't, that was uh, the next year, I believe, after we uh, removed the lawn. You can do a flower garden. Uh, this uh, is the front of uh, the street side portion of our property. And this was all lawn when we got here. Uh, down in the foreground, we've got an annual bed there. And then in the background, um, a pathway through a number of uh, perennial beds. You can do a wildflower meadow. Um, this picture is from uh, Satin Flower Nursery uh, in Saanich, showing their uh, uh, diverse meadow gario ecosystem grasses and wildflowers blend. And we'll, we'll see more about that later. Um, ornamental grasses. Again, a uh, picture from Satin Flower. Uh, they have quite a wide, wide range of uh, grasses, native grasses. Sorry, I should have mentioned Satin Flower Nursery in Saanich is all native plants, uh, West Coast natives. A tapestry lawn. Now, this is an, an, an interesting one, which, uh, again, I hadn't uh, heard of before. It's sort of like a mix between your ornamental ornamental grasses and the wildflower meadow, except what they do is instead of just broadcasting all sorts of seeds, they put it, they plant it in patches. So you can see we've got uh, a patch down here in the bottom, which kind of matches this patch up here and this patch up here and this patch over here. And this matches this, which matches this. So we've got um, we've got this matching that. Oh, sorry. We'll see more about tapestry lawns in a bit. Uh, ground covers. Uh, this is beach strawberry. Uh, again, on my property. Makes a very nice ground cover. It's walkable. Um, so you can walk over. You don't want to put it in the middle of a path. Um, but uh, it's pretty hardy. And then hardscaping, um, patios, walls, staircases, gazebos, I guess, um, anything that just covers the soil. All right. Let's talk a bit more about the wildflower meadow. Um, what you want to do I'll just put that up while I'm talking about the points here. Once you remove the lawn, you can sow uh, your seed mixture uh, directly into the uncovered soil. Or if it's uh, really hard soil, if it's really smooth soil, uh, you can break it up a bit and maybe lightly amend heavy clay, uh, give the seeds a bit of a chance. Uh, if you don't break up say heavy clay, then the seeds are just gonna roll off and, and get lost. So break it up, give the seeds uh, little crevices to, to fall into. Uh, generally broadcast sow in the fall. Uh, a lot of the seeds that you see in these mixtures uh, require uh, a cold spell uh, before they will germinate. So seed in the fall and they'll start to germinate in the spring. Uh, when you do uh, your, your wildflower meadow, note that germination rates will vary. So some will come up before others. Some may take uh, quite a while to come up, but uh, uh, they will, for the most part, come up. When you do this, don't expect that they will immediately crowd out any invasives that may still be there in the, in the soil bank 
uh, beneath the soil surface. You have to watch for invasive species uh, and uh, maybe some grasses that still come start coming back. So you need to be, watch for them. You need to be on top of them. You need to remove them. Uh, over time, uh, reseeding or overseeding may be required to fill in gaps, to fill in bare spots. Uh, this is the diversity meadow from uh, Satin Flower. Uh, their Gary Oak ecosystem. And these are, again, all native plants. And I will be providing um, April with uh, handouts listing all of these. But you can also just go to satinflower.ca. That's satinflower.ca, which you see down at the bottom there. And uh, you should, in any case, because Satin Flower, uh, I was, I'm really impressed with their website. They have a lot of information up there, uh, not only about uh, their seed blends, but how to create a meadow, how to do lawns, how to do this, how to do the other thing. Uh, there's just a, a whole heck of a lot of information up there. This is their clay seasonally wet meadow blend, um, which I have ordered because I have uh, a small patch out front, which this describes really, really well. It's uh, wet and uh, mushy in the winter, but it dries out pretty hard in, in the summer. So I'm really intrigued with this blend to see what it does in that area. Again, satinflower.ca. And their coastal blend. The coastal blend, sorry, I should have been mentioning this. Um, let me go back. Sorry, didn't want to go back that far. Right, the diversity meadow. This is what Satin Flower says about it. A curated and diverse wildflower blend for an instant Gary Oak ecosystem inspired meadow. Natural annuals, perennials, grasses, and rushes, dry to medium and mostly sunny. A full complement of Gary Oak meadow species that will have blooms spring to fall. The clay, uh, clay meadow, a specially selected diverse suite of wildflowers that includes native perennial forbs, grasses, sedges, and rushes. This blend includes an assemblage of species you would expect to find in the wet spectrum of Gary Oak ecosystem meadows on Southern Vancouver Island. Works well in clay soils, that's what I like to hear. Includes mid to late season blooms and full of pollinator favorites. That's also something I like to hear. And then finally, the coastal blend, an attractive, robust cover for sunny slopes and specially customized with salt tolerant species for maritime slopes. Includes a high proportion of deer resistant species. Yeah, wow, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Right, West Coast Seeds also puts out what they call their alternative lawn flower wildflower mix. But you'll notice that this is not a West Coast native seed list. They have, uh, they have some Western North America, uh, Southwest USA, Northern Africa, North America, North America, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Europe, Mediterranean, Europe, Europe, Asia. Uh, but I did spend some time uh, looking each one of these up. And as far as I can tell, none of them are invasive in this area, uh, with the possible exception of white Dutch clover. I've always fought clover in my lawn. I know many people embrace it and actually start to spread clover, which is probably not a bad idea. I still consider it invasive. Ornamental grasses, um, 
this is a selection that uh, I found or uh, researched. Um, nothing really special about these. These are mostly uh, bunch grasses, as you can see. Uh, number five, the blue wild rye looks quite interesting. Um, and some of the other pictures really showed it as blue. Uh, the Romer's fescue number two looks quite nice as well. I have a number of uh, bunch grasses that, that I've been, that I let go uh, every year. They just pop up and I say, fine, um, let's see what you turn out to be. Uh, I don't know that I've ever really successfully identified any of them, but I do like to have bunch grasses uh, throughout the yard. Most of these uh, are available at uh, Satin Flower. Um, NALT has, uh, NALT, the uh, Nanaimo Area Land Trust, uh, has a nursery just south of Nanaimo with native plants. And they have a number of ground uh, grasses as well. Uh, Streamside, Streamside Native Plant Nursery up in Bowser. Um, I can't remember if their catalog contains grasses or not. I don't think it does, which is kind of interesting. Tapestry lawns. These are really interesting. I really like this. A patchwork of low growing perennial flowering plants. Uh, walkable, mowable. Uh, so that's as opposed to uh, a lot of other ground cover um, areas where you can't walk on it. You, you're uh, either crushing the plants or in, in the case of something like Kinnikinnik, you're, you're just destroying the, uh, um, the woody plant. Um, pollinator friendly, uh, low maintenance, no pesticides, herbicides or fertilizers. Yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, a mix of uh, wildflower meadow and ornamental grasses with a major difference that tapestry lawn is planted in patches or groups. So you can't just buy a seed mix because, well, the seeds are mixed. Uh, you're going to have to buy individual seed packets and then plant the seeds in patterns or groups rather than just broadcasting them. So this is a recently planted tapestry lawn at Reading University in uh, in England, and this is the uh, the one that we saw earlier. A little easier to see what's going on in this one, but you can see again that they're they're definitely grouped. Really like this idea. And this is what that same lawn looked like uh, after it was uh, recently mown. And that's what it looks like in the fall. Another one, uh, Avondale Park in London. You can really see the groupings in this one. And I like the way the, the, they've contrasted the dark and the light. Not a lot of color. Maybe just the time of year. Uh, Avondale Park is a small park in London, England, uh, which has a mix of formal gardens, sports facilities, and, and uh, lawns. And this is thought to be Britain's first floral lawn or tapestry lawn, I guess, um, consisting of, uh, oh, hang on a sec. Lost myself, there we go. Uh, this is made of uh, chamomile, thyme, Corsican mint, daisies, red flowering clover, yarrow, pennyroyal, and bugle. 
So eight different species. And that's what it looks like in the winter. So it's not horrible in the winter. It's green and red. All right, what we're going to do now, um, I want to talk about uh, some of the lawn replacement projects that we've done. Starting with the main vegetable bed. So this is what it looked like in uh, May when we uh, first arrived, uh, May of 2009. There again, we see the overgrown uh, garden. That's what it looked like after it was mown. Different angle with pumpkin in the background. Um, this, uh, I've been calling it a rhodo, but it's probably an azalea. Uh, since it, at any rate. Um, so in April of 2010, the next uh, the next spring, uh, that's what it looked like uh, with the sod removed. And again, oh, I I don't really remember how I got rid of the sod, although I do recall doing a double dig. Um. Did I really double dig that entire area? Uh, it was 14 years ago, and I was a much younger man then, so maybe I did. Hmm. Or is that the old side cutter? That might be the side cutter. All right. So I was uh, I was smart. I used a side cutter. How about that? Um, for those who uh, are unfamiliar with double digging, uh, that's what it is. Uh, and it's a lot of work. And I did do some double digging. Um, you take the, uh, dig a trench one shovel wide and 12 inches deep, uh, set the dug up soil aside, loosen the soil at the bottom of the trench with a garden fork. Dig a second trench next to the first and fill the first trench with the soil from the second, loosen the soil at the bottom of the second, and continue until the entire area is dug. That's a lot of area. Maybe, maybe it's the, uh, maybe it was this area that I did the double dig in. You notice in, in over here, this area hadn't been done yet, but this area had been. Maybe. All right, by June of that year, the garden is in. And we did fairly well that year. I think we had a lot more sun back then. That was 14 years ago. Things seem to have grown up a lot since then. We don't we just don't get as much sun in this uh, in this garden. But we did pretty good that year. So from that to that. All right. And then we decided to extend it. Uh, in April of 2010, that same year, uh, we had uh, new perimeter drains put in, and so uh, we saw this big backhoe come in to do the heavy digging, and we thought, well, why don't we use that and remove some more of the lawn? So that's what we did, and we got them to come in and extend the, the main vegetable garden. That's some pretty heavy compact clay underneath the so so soil there. Um, I don't remember what we did with that sod, but it probably went to DBL. While they were there, they also did the uh, street side garden uh, and the uh, east vegetable garden, and we'll get to those in a moment or two. So by March, um, that's what it looked like. Um, this area in here, 
is what the backhoe did. And then, then uh, I rototilled it and put compost on top. And then started to define the pathways through the garden. There I am with the rototiller. There's pumpkin. And so this is the area, the new extension area, and uh, the path. And what I do uh, on my garden paths is uh, use the white uh, wood chips. I find they work really, really well. Um, nice thick layer will really help to suppress the weeds. Uh, it's great to walk on. Nice and spongy underfoot. And then a couple of weeks later, we decided to extend it again. And this time I, I definitely used the side cutter. And uh, you'll see, uh, there's the, the roto again for Azalea. Uh, and so it's this area in here that we filled in. So right in here to the uh, plant. Uh, without leaves at this point, and then decided, and then uh, started to define the uh, the garden wall. These uh, these stones are um, called Castle Rock or Castle Stone. Uh, they came from K2 Stone here in Nanaimo, uh, but they don't offer them anymore. Boy, were they nice to work with. So building the wall, I probably over-engineered it a bit, but um, I started by digging a trench, filling it with gravel, and then laying the stones down. And you'll note that I'm doing uh, a double wall here. You can see it uh, in the center one as well. Uh, that's because I, I've got a planter in there. I filled it with soil, and uh, I have plants growing in there. Looks really sharp, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, this section of the wall is complete. And yes, it did take four years to get to this point. Um, and it took several more before I was willing to call it completed. I just got involved in other things. There's the completed wall this section anyway. Um, there's more over, over here. It extends all the way over to the fence. Uh, same sort of thing with the, the castle rock. I thought it turned out rather well. I don't like it. All right. We're running out of time. So, um, moving on, the east vegetable bed, uh, October, when we got here, or the next year, just before the backhoe arrived, uh, and then with all of the uh, grass stripped away, and this is what we did with it. Um, in May of 2012, we put in a little tiny uh, ocean spray. That's the, uh, you see quite often along roadsides. It's a native plant. Um, and uh, by June, we had a, a nice crop of broad beans going and a few other things. And there's a little ocean spray again. Nine years later, uh, we put in a, a brick wall and uh, there's that little tiny ocean spray nine years later. It's above the, uh, above the roof line. And uh, in the spring, when it blooms, it's it's really quite nice. Street side, this is what it looked like. Um, over here, uh, quite unkempt. And you can see, no, no, don't do that. Where did we go? Uh, you can see that they've uh, they were planting right up against the wall, 
Same here, right up against the wall. There's pumpkin again. Uh, but it's all just lawn. Uh, this crab apple uh, didn't survive. And so this area in here is now what's what we call the dogwood bed. Uh, the holly is gone, replaced by a Mahonia X media. So there's our backhoe. Actually, front end, isn't it? Um, stripping away all the grass, you can see the uh, perimeter, perimeter drain is in. All of these roots are from three Norway poplars on the other side of the uh, fence line. Boy, were they a hassle. Um, we fought the city for quite a while to, to get rid of them. Three of them eventually died, and so we got rid of them. They got rid of them, which was good. But we still fight with these roots quite a bit. Um, so here we're defining uh, the walls and the pathways. Uh, we started putting some perennials, uh, defining the path through, uh, th through this area. We like curved paths. Uh, so we're defining the, the beds here. And that's what we wound up with. Perennial beds all through here. We kept this uh, pretty much an annual bed for, for years. Uh, we put vegetables in there at one point and the pathway through the perennials. And then finally the orchard, uh, and I'll whip through this one really quickly. Um, again, that's what it looked like uh, when we got here. Uh, July of this year, there's Grady on a little machine, um, three feet wide. It's just able to fit through the uh, gateway. Uh, so we were able to bring it out back. And that's what he did. Uh, he just stripped all of the grass away. And then, uh, and then because it was, uh, we were fearing a really hot summer. Uh, we, we laid down a, a thin layer of compost and then uh, bark mulch around uh, the root zones of all of the uh, all of the trees. We've got a we've got a couple of apple trees. We got a really good crop here. You can see a bit uh, over here on the on the left. Really good crop off of both of these trees this year. Well, this one is still coming. Um, cherry tree, quince. Uh, we put in Saskatoon, just starting out, little guy. We'll see how he does. And that's it. And that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Cameron. That was great. Um, I see we've got a few questions in the Q&A. Um, Joe and Richard, I think you were going to take Yeah, it. the first question is comments on the use of corn gluten on the lawn. Sorry, could you tell, uh, say the question again? Comment on the use of corn gluten on the lawn. Well, it will help um, with the seed, with the weeds. Um, as I said, it, it, the application timing is, is really, really tricky. And if you're overseeding uh, your lawn, uh, it will kill the, the uh, grass seeds as well as any, uh, uh, or any grass um, shoots as well as any weed sh shoots that come up. I found using the corn gluten in the spring uh, probably the, the best time for me because you're getting all the weed seeds that are starting to germinate at that point in time. But actually finding a period of time afterwards where it's dry is the difficult part, at least here on Vancouver Island. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have another question here from Elle. Advice on handling buttercup in the lawn. It's a pretty drained part shade area. Uh, I think you're hooped actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's really not much you can do uh, in a lawn. Uh, I've had buttercup in areas where um, I don't care about the lawn or there is no lawn. And in that case, it, it's relatively easy. You just work at it and dig it up uh, year after year after year. And I eventually managed to get rid of it from that area. But in a lawn, it's it's really difficult. Uh, yeah, I, like Jan says, it's a pain. Myself, I found that if you see it, jump on it. <laughs> because if you wait too long, the stolons have gone all over the lawn and then you have a whole lawn full of buttercup. Yeah. At that point, you might just, just decide to replace the lawn with something else altogether. And, well, yes, and, that that was my, and that was my uh, um, uh, experience with it as well, and uh, just staying on top of it. And uh, uh, the fact that it is um, wet and shady and Creeping Buttercup is native, and that's what it likes. Um, I left that one area um, and kept it to one end of the lawn that was always wet and I had trouble draining it and just let it be there uh, and uh, just didn't let it move into the lawn. So I, I had a patch uh, of flowers, you know, at the edge of the lawn. And I found that my self-seeding uh, Thomasiana crocus didn't care. They just kind of popped up in and among it. So it, it sort of worked. But it's it's a pain. You got to keep at it. Yeah. So we have a question from Ellen. I have moss growing in full sun. How do I get rid of it? Moss growing in full sun. Now, now that's kind of interesting. Um, I would I would think then that you you've probably got a fairly moist area because the moss really needs moisture. So you can try uh, increasing the drainage. Um, make sure you're not overwatering. Lime also helps to a certain degree. What's that? Liming it just so that you raise uh, the pH. There are mosses that um, tolerate sun here. Um, on the island and in the Northwest um, coast generally. And um, what I used to do was where I had patches of moss is that I would just simply um, take a little hand rake, rake it up because it doesn't have roots. Moss is one uh, cell mm -hmm. thick and it has little hold fasts. So under that moss, you'll have either sometimes a bit of thatch You'll have something, and I would simply aerate it, overseed it with um, shade tolerant uh, grass seed, and just bit by bit, patch by patch, I got rid of the moss that I didn't want, and then kept the moss I did. And the nice thing about moss, it's green year round, especially here on the coast. So a moss lawn is not that difficult to deal with, especially if you're in a uh, shaded area and stuff like that. It's always nice to have some green there. And I think we have to remember here too that a lot of the lawns that we have are not native and our soil uh, is not um, particularly nice to them. I mean, grasses like neutral soil, we have acid soil. Moss is meant for acid soil. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think like uh, like you, Richard, that it's quite beautiful. So some people get a little upset having moss in their lawn, but um, I wouldn't fight it myself, except wow. where I really want a sunny patch of green, you know. We have another uh, question from Anonymous. Is plastic, black plastic sheeting different from landscape, landscape cloth or weed barrier? Do you recommend landscape cloth weed barrier? They are different. Uh, the landscape cloth uh, weed barrier um, is woven and um, uh, water can get through it into the soil down below 
gas exchange can happen through it. Uh, it's meant more as a mechanical um, uh, barrier for for sprouting weeds. The black plastic is uh, black plastic. It's solid, and uh, there's no gas exchange. There is no uh, moisture exchange whatsoever. So it tends to just kill everything underneath it. Yeah, if you're building a garden on where the lawn was in black plastic, leaving it in place for about a year or so, and just cooking everything under it, the weed seeds and everything else, is probably the way of going. But, you know, black plastic, anything that you cover the soil with will hamper either the microorganisms in the soil or water or light or whatever. So my personal opinion, don't use it. Just add a nice organic mulch to your soil, like a bark mulch or wood chips or anything like that. So we have another question here uh, from our, uh, from Anonymous also. Are those native wildflowers perennials? Um, the, the West Coast seeds, um, no, the, the native from satin flower, no, uh, not necessarily. They're a mix of annuals and perennials, uh, with the idea that the annuals will self sow, uh, and, uh, according to the, uh, according to the satin flower will, uh, usually persist for years and years. The only other thing I might add to that is make sure you get um, a wildflower mix that is actually for your area. If you live in a dry area, well, then not all wildflower seed mixes will work for you. So make sure that the seed mix that you do get is recommended for your area. Also, you got to watch for um, invasive species. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can, of course, create your own uh, wildflower mix. Uh, it takes a lot of research, but um, you can take a look at what uh, satin flower and uh, Nalt and Streamside and uh, there are a couple of native plant nurseries on uh, Salt Spring Island. Uh, take a look at their inventories and uh, then start doing research uh, as to uh, what they want, uh, what the plants want um, as far as exposure and moisture and so on and so forth. It's a lot of work, but you can do it. Alan has a question for you. Uh, how much land do you have? Uh, we've got uh, just under half an acre. And is it all gardened? Uh, still got uh, a section of, of lawn, uh, which we use for uh, bocce and uh, and badminton and, and rolling around on. <laughs> Good. Uh, Jan Dwyer, what is corn gluten? I've never heard of it. Not, I did. Uh, I did give some information on it in the in the chat. Oh, good. Can, can you read it out? Sure. Uh, corn gluten uh, is a, is a meal, like a seed meal, and um, it's the natural bra uh, byproduct from um, the process of wet milling and corn. So it's very high in protein. Can contain sixty percent protein. That's why they use it as a feed supplement. Um, but it also um, uh, suppresses weeds. Um, and you can get it at farm stores or garden centers. Um, I never I never had much success with it because I found that it um, glommed very easily, like any gluten. And uh, I really had to mix it into the soil a lot. And I found other things um, for my soil just as effective but a lot of people swear by it um and if you're paying for something you're not going to buy it again if it doesn't work and i've heard a lot of people really like it 
Well, Scott's has a product that they tout with cornmeal in it, and it's, uh, you know, the fuel that you use in those uh, uh, heaters. The ethanol. The, yeah. No. The what are they called? Uh, pellets. Oh, the gel. The gel. Yeah, no, the pellets. Yeah. Yeah. So, the corn gluten that I've gotten is in little pellets, basically. And as Scott sells it, you can get it at uh, Costco, most likely in the spring. They don't carry it all year round, but just the springtime. I would also caution people to, to do their own research on corn gluten, because one of the things that I've read is that uh, the corn gluten that you use for as a pesticide is very specific. And uh, it's not the same as other corn uh, meal products that you can get. Uh, and some people, uh, rather unscrupulous, unscrupulous people, will sell you the, the wrong stuff uh, as a pesticide. So make sure you do your research. Yeah, buy it from a reputable company. Um, like Scott's is fairly re reputable, so you should. You could pretty well believe that there it's actually what it it is what they say it is. Okay. We have no more questions. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending.